What's up guys, if you're interested in getting sweet altars like these every month, you can do so by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com slash it resolves. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Crack a Pack series. Before we get into this pack opening of Oath of the Gate Watch, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to all of the support to all of you, uh, not only for entering the giveaway and showing your support there, but for also showing your support for us reaching 300 Crack a Pack episodes. Honestly, this week in general has been fantastic. Not only did we hit 300 on the Crack a Packs and have a so far very successful giveaway. Uh, but on top of that, we also got to welcome our, our very good friend and Instagram partner, Justin, uh, from Red, Guns, Red Zone Gaming, excuse me, uh, to the podcast episode, which was super, super fun. Uh, we did have a small echo issue and things like that with the audio, but overall, I think it was a really, really fun time. A lot of you guys seem to really enjoy it as well. So very thankful for all of you uh, who took the time to watch or listen to that episode. Uh, we hope that you really enjoyed it, and we do have plans to bring him back on, as well as potentially other guests in the future uh, if that's something you guys are interested in so very excited there of course today though we are continuing the crack a pack series with episode 301 and we have oath of the gate watch which is not the most exciting set in the world however uh, there are still some really cool cards in this set so ho hopefully we'll actually get to see something really really fun uh, obviously a lot of really powerful uh, synergies in this set uh, that I'm really excited to talk about as we go through but we will go through this of course as it it's a pack one pick one scenario so hopefully we'll be able to figure out what our pack one pick one would be if we were drafting this set our first card here is uh, Makindi Aeronaut uh, Makandi Aeronaut. I hope I'm saying that correctly. It's a 1-3 uh, for one and a white, and it has flying. It is a scout uh, as well as an ally, a core ally, core scout ally, excuse me. Uh, allies tend to have some synergy. Uh, overall, though, this is just kind of an okay early game blocker. It's not really an amazing card by any means. Uh, if anything, it's more of a curve consideration card. Uh, it does have flying, which is nice. It's evasive, but it is still just a 1-3. So a lot of times you'll find yourself probably blocking stuff with this. It's not the most aggressive card in the world. Uh, but it is a nice 2-drop. I mean, it fills the curve. So if you're needing uh, a 2-drop white card, this is perfectly fine. Uh, Umara Entangler. Uh, again, hoping I'm saying that correctly, is a 2-1 for 1 and a blue, and it has prowess. So anytime you cast a non-creature spell, this gets plus 1, plus 1 until the end of the turn. Something to, to note here that is actually pretty important, it's not just instants or sorceries. I think uh, some people might, at the time, have gotten that a little bit confused. It is non-creature spells. It's any kind of spell that is not a creature. So artifacts, enchantments, anything uh, does actually trigger prowess, which does make it even better, uh, rather than it just being instants and sorceries, which on its own right is not bad as well uh, but this is definitely a little bit of a step up the prowess mechanic very very powerful however uh, a little bit in my opinion downgraded in limited only because you tend to have a much higher creature count than anything else now obviously if you're in that prowess deck you can kind of draft around that but this is by no means a reason to be in that deck and so very clearly not a first pickable card but if you're in that deck you find yourself with a lot of non-creature spells this is a great two drop for you it, it can be an early game threat uh just based on the other cards that you're playing throughout your deck as a normal game plan so it does have that upside overall though obviously not a first pickable card uh consuming sinkhole is three and a red for an instant it has devoid so even though there's red in its mana cost uh it technically has no color which on its own has a lot of synergies and things like that with the eldrazi and stuff so uh you do get to choose one exile target land creature uh which does actually have some relevance in this set or it deals four damage to target player uh, the good thing here is that it is a flexible spell, so it's going to be able to target something no matter what. You're always going to have an opposing player, so at the very worst, it's 4 mana for 4 damage at instant speed to your opponent. The downside is obviously you kind of want to hit the land creature. You want this to be a removal spell. Obviously, there are going to be times where you might just be able to win on the, on the spot with a card like this, which is great. Definitely for that, it's fantastic. 
Uh, but the, the land creature, while it is relevant in this set, and you probably will run into some mechanics like that with Awaken, I think it was Awaken, was the uh, mechanic that basically turned a bunch of lands into creatures and you got to do a bunch of stuff with it. Uh, you might not always run up against that mechanic. Now, it is pretty likely that you'll see some of it, but it's not going to be the most prominent thing, most likely. And so a lot of times this might end up just being four damage to the face, which again is not terrible, but I'd prefer to hit the creature uh, just to kind of get that game plan moving and keep their board presence down as much as possible. Uh, and so it's, it's a bit of a give and take. It is a flexible card. I like it for that reason. And so far it's probably the pick, uh, but it's not a super exciting card in my mind. Uh, Vines of the Recluse excuse me, <coughs> uh, is an incident for one green. Excuse me, guys. Uh, target creature gets plus one, plus two, and gains reach until the end of the turn, and then you untap it. Uh, very basic combat trick. What I like about this, though, is you get to swing in with the creature on your turn and then surprise block it because this untaps that creature. So it's actually really, really good for that. Uh, you do have to use it before blocks. I just want to point that out, obviously. You can't block it if it's, or you can't block with it, excuse me, if it's already tapped and doesn't work that way. So you do have to do it at instant speed before blocks, but it is really, really nice to kind of sneak that out. Uh, and for only one green mana, it's very efficient. If I happen to be in a green deck, definitely taking it. Otherwise, not super interested. Uh, Kozilex Translator uh, is a 3-5 for 4 and a black. Again, featuring the void, so it technically has no color. Uh, you can pay one life and add one generic mana to your mana pool. Activate this ability only once each turn. So it's kind of ramp. Uh, it's a little bit weird because it's in the... It's tech... Well... It's technically no color, but it does require black to cast. And the red black deck, from my memory at least, tended to be a little bit more aggro focused. And this seems to be much more ramp focused. Now, obviously, maybe there's a green black synergy or something like that that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, but it's not huge ramp by any means. I don't think it's by, it, it's probably not the best ramp that you could possibly have. It's not something I'm super interested in. It's a 3 5 for 5, which is pretty bad on the stats end. Uh, maybe there's some Devoid Synergy out there that makes it worth it, but in general, not super exciting. Uh, Saddleback Lagic, Lagic, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, is a 3-1 for 3 and a green. I didn't realize there were so many, uh, difficult to pronounce things. Maybe I am just not great at pronouncing things, but still. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you support two. So you put a plus one, plus one counter on each of up to two target creatures. Uh, which I really, really like. So far, I think this is the most aggressive pick. Uh, it's just a really solid 4-drop. Uh, yeah, the stats aren't amazing, but being able to, to throw some counters onto some creatures is really, really good. Uh, and so I really like this card. Gives you that aggressive edge and keeps your creatures one step ahead of the opponent's creatures, ideally, uh, if you're in a board stall position or something like that, just throw your counters on the cards that most make sense, and then you can hopefully keep swinging in for some damage. So a lot of really aggressive stuff with this, and I love it a lot. Uh, Vampire Envoy is a 1-4 for 2 and a black. Uh, it has flying, and when it becomes tapped, you gain 1 life. So, really interesting card. Uh, on the stats end of things, it's not amazing, but for 3 mana, it does have flying, and it has a big butt, which means it's probably going to be able to block or at least survive pretty well. Uh, naturally, if you can only attack with this, it's probably not the best. Yes, you can gain a life, but you're only dealing one damage to the opponent, and a lot of times they're probably going to have something to block it. Uh, and so the ideal situation is to maybe throw an enchant creature on this that means you have to tap it every turn or do something like that and then gain that life off of it. I do think it's fine, uh, and it is an ally, so there's synergies there, but I don't think it's amazing. I don't think it's necessarily a great card to pick uh, at the three drop slot. I like the Saddleback a lot better just because it's much more aggressive. Uh, but I, there are instances where I would definitely take it. I don't think it's a bad card by any means. Uh, Tajuru, man, this is killing me. Tajuru Pathwarden. Uh, hope I'm saying that correctly as well. It's a 5 4 for 4 and a green with Vigilance and Trample. Uh, this is actually a pretty aggressive 5 drop. So, uh, 5 4 for 5, not perfect in terms of stats, but it's pretty close. Uh, it's not far away at all. And that having Vigilance and Trample is huge because if they're only playing a bunch of little dudes, uh, they're going to have to either triple, double, triple block, something like that just to get rid of this guy. And if they don't, it's just going to keep damaging over with that trample and you're still going to be landing uh, some damage onto the opponent. Not only that, but it has vigilance, which means you don't have to tap it. So it can stay up as a blocker 
as well as continually be aggressive every single turn. So I really like this card. I think I like it more than the Saddleback. I don't know if that's 100% correct, but I just, I really, really like the fact that it has Vigilance and you can leave it up uh, as a defender as well as continually punch in. I think that's huge. Uh, Goblin Freerunner is a 3-2 for 3 and a red. It has Surge. So for one and a red, you can cast this spell for its Surge cost. Uh, if you or a teammate has cast another spell this turn. So if you've cast another spell, you can cast it for only two. I like that quite a lot. And it also has Menace, so it can only be blocked by two or more creatures. Uh, fairly aggressive card. It, it does something that red does well, which is get to the point where you can play multiple th spells per turn very, very quickly. Uh, and this is sort of a reward for that. So if you can play a one mana spell or a two mana spell on maybe turn three or four, you can then throw this out as well uh, as a bit of an added bonus. And I really, really like that. Uh, I think on raw power level, the Path Warden is probably a bit more, uh, a bit stronger, I will say, but this definitely rewards what red does well, and I like that. Uh, I'm going to keep them together for now because I'm not 100% sure which is actually better. The Menace really puts this one over the edge for me, uh, but both are very, very good. Uh, Holdout Settlement is a land. It can tap for a generic mana, uh, and then you can tap it and tap an untapped creature you control and add one mana of any color to your mana pool. These are classic, like fairly, not I won't say expensive, but fairly intensive uh, mana fixer lands. And they're perfectly fine to run if you happen to find yourself in a situation where you need multiple colors. They're not ideal because on general, they just add generic mana. Uh, and you have to add in a little bit more to get colored mana out of it. Now, obviously, there are times where that generic mana is perfectly fine. That's all you need. And so it works out. But if you happen to need fixing or something like that, this is a perfectly fine uh, land to pick. It's not amazing, but it's not bad either. <coughs> uh, our first uncommon here is Seed Guardian. Uh, it's a 3-4 for 2 and 2 green with Reach. And when it dies, put an XX green elemental creature token onto the battlefield where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Okay, well, this is great. So... Uh, it's a 3-4 four for 4. Not amazing, but it does have reach, which means it's going to be able to block things with flying. A lot of upside there. Uh, keeps the skies at least a little bit clear for you, which is good. And then on top of that, it devalues any kind of removal that your opponent has with this creature. Because ideally, if they've been killing some creatures all game, uh, if you're in the mid to late game, you probably have lost a few at that point. Uh, this just spits out another creature which means they're going to have to have two removal spells to truly deal with this card. And that's a lot of value just off of one card. Uh, and so for that, it's a it's a built-in two-for-one. You absolutely love two-for-ones in Limited. This is a perfect example of that. Uh, Bonds of Mortality is an enchantment for one and a green. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card and then you can pay a green and creatures your opponents control lose hexproof and indestructible until the end of the turn. Uh, don't love this card. It's a bit niche. Uh, you could definitely sideboard this in if you find yourself needing it. Uh, a lot of times, like the lands, uh, the creature lands might have indestructible or something along those lines based on the cards that were used to play them and things. So there are instances where you'll need this, but it's much more of a sideboard card, not necessarily main deckable at all. <clears throat> Uh, Thought Harvester is our last uncommon. It's a 2-4 for 3 and a blue. Again, featuring Devoid, it technically has no color. Does have flying, and then whenever you cast a colorless spell, target opponent exiles the top card of his or her library. Uh, exile is really important in this set. There are cards that uh, care very much about cards that are being exiled. Uh, and so a lot of times you'll see that versus just, you know, throw into the graveyard or something along those lines. Um, I think this is fine, but it's not amazing. Uh, the flying is nice. It gives it a bit of an evasion uh, mechanic, which is great. Uh, and then it does have that synergy. If you do happen to need that uh, exile clause or something along those lines, it's perfectly fine for that reason. But I think the value in the Seed Guardian is just so, so high. It's really difficult to top that uh, as an at uncommon at the very least. And so I don't think that this necessarily does. If you're in blue, it's a very nice card to have, though, for sure. And again, that synergy is what's important. You really want to have cards that ma that care about the cards that are exiled. Uh, and then our rare here is Needle Spires. So it's a land. It's called a man land for uh, just slang, I guess you could say. Uh, and it enters the battlefield tapped, but it does tap for red or white. So it is a dual land technically. 
Uh, and then you can pay two, a red and a white, and it becomes a 2-1 red and white creature uh, with double strike until the end of the turn. So again, we see man lands being a thing. Uh, destroying creature lands can be very relevant in this set. And this is only one example of it, uh, but it is a very good land. If you happen to find yourself uh, in the red-white deck, I think this is a good pick. I don't know that it's really great anyway. Uh, it's fine, but I don't think it's first pickable, uh, at least not over the Seed Guardian. Um, it's a lot of mana to invest in a creature that could potentially just die to a removal spell. I don't find that amazing. Uh, it does give your deck a little bit more uh, dynamics in terms of like your opponents really are going to have to play around something like this, which is good uh, to force your opponent into that situation. But again, the value on that Seed Guardian is just so, so high. It's very difficult to beat that. So as much as I like this card, I don't think it's the, the, the pick here. Uh, we do have our full art land here and then our elemental creature token. But honestly, for me, Seed Guardian is the pick, in my opinion. Uh, if you disagree, please feel free to let me know in the comment section below. I'm happy to talk about that. Love having that conversation. Uh, but I think that's going to wrap up this episode. If you did enjoy it, please make sure to leave a like or a comment down below. And as always, please make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome content. But with that, I'm going to get out of here. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next Crack-A-Pack episode.